So I am recording, which means I'm going to upload this to YouTube, uh, although it's going to also live on my Facebook. But if you find it interesting, you can totally send it to anyone who um, may be interested. I can tell that I keep freezing. Hopefully you guys can at least hear me. Yeah, you can. Okay, I'm just gonna get into it. It doesn't really matter if you can't see my face moving. Um, hopefully, you'll still find the information <laughs> interesting. Okay, so um, yeah, let's just hop right on in. Um, so tonight I'm gonna be talking about the chemistry of essential oils, which I find to be an incredibly fascinating topic. Um, as a Christian, I think that learning about this stuff has just really opened my eyes so much more to God's intention and his design and everything. Um, there are so many plants that I really never even thought twice about, just thought maybe they were pretty or they smelled good um, or some, some of them taste good, but I had no idea that he had put such thought and design into every plant that is here on earth and it just really has given me such a more like a deep appreciation for um, just his detail and how he does everything for our good really um, so yeah I want to put as a disclaimer um, I'm gonna be talking about oils and a lot of their different um, constituents, what they do, and I just want to say that none of this should ever replace medical advice. Um, I totally believe in modern medicine as something that's very useful in a certain time and certain place, um, but I don't believe that it's always the answer or the thing we should turn to first, but I'm not a doctor, um, not even close, so please do not take this as medical advice. Um, always consult your doctor first. Um, so let's just talk about the basics of what essential oils are. So um, that's kind of where we're going to start and then we'll dive a little deeper into the chemistry of it. So essential oils support the body's natural response to harmful bacteria, free radicals, inflammation, miswritten cell memory, and a lot more. They can really actually support every um, part of our body like every um what's the word that i'm looking for like every system in our body they are the volatile liquid that's inside the plant and it contains healing properties that we can use for our own bodies um i have some graphics makes it i feel like it makes it easier to learn um i don't know why they're not showing up let me try this again there we go. Okay. Now it doesn't really matter if I'm frozen. You'll get to see this. Okay. Let's do this. There we go. Okay. So you have um, two types. Plants are made up of two types of metabolites. You have your primary metabolites. Um, which produce protein, lipids, and carbohydrates. And then you have your secondary metabolites that are the constituents found in the plants, like alkaloids, flavonoids, and more. Um, these metabolites are basically a byproduct of the plant's metabolism. So, um, yeah. Okay, secondary metabolites are byproducts of the plant, but they are not actually necessary for the plant to live. So this is a really common misconception in the essential oil world that, hey, Vanessa, glad you're here, um, that they are like, quote unquote, the lifeblood of the plant. They are basically what the plant needs to survive, um, but they can actually live without the essential oils, the secondary metabolites, but they are actually still very important to the plant because they attract pollinators, they have built-in predatory defense and disease resistance, and they enable the plant to grow and thrive in their environment. They're also very healing for humans. So like if a plant were to get injured, it would 
use the essential oils to heal. Um, this happens in some plants, like visibly that you can see. So like one um, essential oil we love is frankincense. And the way that they extract frankincense is by like cutting into the tree and then it excretes this resin. And that is the frankincense resin that we distill into essential oil. So it's actually, it's excreting the resin to help heal the tree. Um, I just did an oils of the Bible class last night that was just like amazing. And I just was so thankful that God even gave me the opportunity to um, share about that. And um, there's some really cool uh, like comparisons you can draw with frankincense and Jesus. And it's just really cool because of course, Jesus was given frankincense as a baby, but I won't go into all that. Okay, so there are two kinds of um, secretory or secretory structures um, that make up essential oils. So a plant either has external secretory structures or internal ex secretory structures. So an example of external would be basil, mint, rosemary, lavender, oregano, something where you can actually rub the leaf or rub the leaves together and you can smell the oil and it will um, actually like come out of the surface of the plant. Whereas internal can be a few different kinds like cavities, ducts, or cells that contain essential oils. So cavities would be like lime, orange, or lemon. Those are actually found in the rind of the plant. So that's where we get like lemon essential oil. It's not from the fruit itself, it's the rind, which is really cool because the rind isn't as acidic, um, so, and it's not as bitter, so you can use lemon essential oil, and it's not quite the same as using like lemon juice. Um, ducks would be pine, spruce, chamomile, and cells, which would be like, the essential oils are actually in the structure of the plant. Um, that would be nutmeg, ginger. Um, a cool example of um, how you know plants and essential oils adapt is uh, would be Douglas fir trees. They release terpenes from their needles to defend against the spruce budworm and every year the tree will vary the composition and the production of these terpenes to decrease the ability of the budworm to develop widespread immunity to those compounds. So um, essential oils may adapt and change along with the needs of the plant. So essential oils versus fatty oils, essential oils versus herbs. Um, fatty oils are different from essential oils. So fatty oils would be something like olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil. Um, and they come from pressing the seed of a plant. They cannot pass through cell membranes and they're greasy to the touch. So essential oils, um, they absorb into your skin very easily and they don't leave that greasy residue like fatty oils might. Um, fatty oils also don't have that same like therapeutic benefits and it doesn't have the same effect on our emotions. Um, essential oils are 100 to 10,000 times more concentrated than herbs. So I know a lot of people that you know they want to do natural things and they use herbs but when we use essential oils we're going to get a much higher effect because they are so much more concentrated. Okay, frequencies. This is really important when we're talking about the chemistry of oils and when we're talking about how they affect our bodies. Um, I used to think that frequencies were kind of like, maybe like new age, kind of weird. It's where people get, when they say like your energy, quote unquote, or um, your vibes. Um, this comes from and stems from the fact that every substance on earth produces a bioelectric frequency. So everything that is alive has a frequency. Um, a healthy human brain produces 72 to 90 hertz and a healthy body produces 62 to 78 hertz. So basically, um, everything around us is giving off this frequency, this energy, and 
when our body's frequency gets too low, disease begins. So if you've ever heard someone say like in the natural living world that they are trying to stay above the wellness line, this basically means that we are keeping our bodies um, and our frequency high enough to keep us healthy. Hey Jacqueline, sorry, I just saw your comment. Um, so whenever our frequency gets too low, we start to encounter a lot of problems. And um, I love learning about this because it just shows me um, that what the enemy may want to use and twist, um, there is still truth to it and it is God's design and he may have taken it out of context and twisted it to um, some false beliefs that I don't agree with, but there still is that truth of God's design and purpose. And that to me just um, is so encouraging and it makes me want to seek out the truth behind things that maybe I don't agree with and find out where God might be in it. So essential oils have the highest frequency of any natural substance on earth. Um, my computer's frozen. There we go. Um, yeah, okay. So essential oils have the highest frequency of any natural substance on earth, and they create an environment where bacteria, fungus, and disease cannot live. So this is a pretty cool example of the difference. So you have processed food that's going to be zero hertz. It has no frequency. It's just dead. It's, it, it produces no frequency. Okay, dried herbs are 12 to 22 hertz. Fresh herbs are 20 to 27 hertz. Fresh produce is 15 hertz. So those are the things we may look at and be like, okay, these are really healthy and really good for me. I'm going to have a lot of these. But if you look, when you start getting into the essential oils, the frequency just jumps significantly higher. So peppermint oil, a really simple oil, is at 78 hertz. Lavender oil is 118, frankincense 147, and rose oil is 320 hertz, you guys. This is crazy. So this is why people say like if you sniff a bottle of rose oil, you're going to get like almost like an instant high just from smelling it. It's gonna really do something to your body and it's because its frequency is so high that it's automatically going to help raise your body's frequency just by inhaling it. And um, that's going to just make you a healthier person in general. Um, so I wanted to show you guys this. Um, they have been able to measure where our frequencies are at whenever we start to experience certain diseases. Um, so colds and flus start at 57 to 60 hertz. So when our body gets down to that level, we start to get colds and flus. Disease starts at 58. Candida overgrowth starts at 55. We become receptive to Epstein-Barr at 52, receptive to cancer at 42, and death begins at 25 hertz. So um, doing things to help increase our frequency is going to help our health overall. Um, our environment and the substances we consume, obviously, like we just talked about, the food we consume, if they're low frequency or no frequency, it's going to affect our body's frequency. And the environment around us is also going to affect it. Um, so, yeah. But in addition to that, our emotions can actually either raise or lower our frequencies. So um, this is where, you know, taking every thought captive and um, aligning our emotions with uh, what, you know, God would desire for us, you know, thinking on everything that is pure and holy, all of those things that the Bible teaches us, there's such significance to that. Um, it directly affects even our health. So when our mental and emotional health is not right, it can actually affect our physical health um, simply from affecting our frequencies, which is really crazy, but it just shows you again, God is in all of the details and he designed this really specifically. 
And I just love here that the proof is in the pudding. Using essential oils is going to raise your frequency. I have this roller right here that I feel like just raises my frequencies like crazy. It smells so good. It makes me so happy every time I smell it. So that is part of the reason why I'm constantly putting oils on myself all the time because I know that um, even just from putting them on, um, it's going to help keep me healthier, even if they're not like quote unquote immune supporting oils. My phone is glitching. I will be rewatching this. It might be my signal. That's the unfortunate thing. I hope not though. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> okay, free radicals and antioxidants. So, okay, free radicals are everywhere, all around us, and it's really important that we understand free radicals and oxidative stress and what antioxidants are so that we can work to combat oxidative stress. Um, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because, um, spoiler alert, uh, essential oils are extremely high in antioxidants. So, okay, free radicals are molecules that are unpaired, um, that have an unpaired electron. So if you know about molecules, um, they have electrons that float around the nucleus and every electron likes to be paired in pairs of two. And so sometimes um, there may be a, an electron that doesn't have a pair. And so what it does is it's gonna scavenge the body looking for a vulnerable um, cell that it can steal an electron from. And when it does this, it ends up damaging otherwise healthy normal cells. And when oxygen molecules split into single atoms that have unpaired electrons, they become unstable free radicals that seek other atoms or molecules to bond to. So this is just, this is what oxidative stress is. It's um, that point of when your, your body is under stress because these free radicals are stealing from healthy cells and it's creating all of this stress within your body. And um, as this continues to happen, oxidative stress will lead to aging, signs of aging, such as wrinkles, graying hair, loss of hair. Um, it can lead to Alzheimer's and dementia. It can lead to cardiovascular disease due to clogged arteries, cataracts and age-related vision decline, diabetes and gen genetic degenerative diseases like Huntington's and Parkinson's. Um, but what happens whenever we introduce antioxidants into our body, these antioxidants have extra electrons that it can lend to these free radicals and stabilize the cell itself. So when we consume things that have a lot of free radicals, I mean, a lot of antioxidants, um, they are measured by what's called the ORAC value. And it's basically the capacity for a substance to oxidize um, other cells and lend that electron. So um, yeah, as far as free radicals, they can be found in air pollutants, tobacco smoke, fried and processed foods, alcohol, medicine, pesticides, and more stuff. They're just, they're all over. Um, they are all over our environment. But antioxidants can be found in a lot of quote unquote superfoods, uh, but they are found in much larger quantities in essential oils. So here's another comparison for you. We have the ORAC value of um, several superfoods that people consume for their antioxidant properties, like blueberries that has a 2400 ORAC value, um, kale, it's another superfood, that's 1770, which seems like a lot, but when you look at the essential oils, it's again, like you can't even begin to compare them. Um, clove is known to have one of the highest antioxidant values of any essential oil or really any substance on earth at 1,078,700. That's 
crazy. <laughs> so um, that is a part of the reason why I always put glow clove in all of my immunity rollers. I just love to get that on my body to help support my body. So again, getting essential oils in your body is going to help tremendously with oxidative stress. So that's another way you can combat disease and um, aging in your body. Okay, now a lot of people uh, wonder how often they should be using essential oils and some people will use an essential oil and say that it doesn't work. And one of the reasons that they experience this is because they are not applying oils often enough. So essential oils have such tiny molecules that they can really do amazing things in our body. They can cross the blood brain barrier and enter the brain within 22 seconds of being inhaled. Within two minutes of being applied, they can be detected in the bloodstream. And within 20 minutes, they can be found in every cell of the body. The reason this is, is because the body is composed of 100 trillion cells, but essential oils are composed of 40 million trillion cells per drop. So that means one drop of essential oil can cover every single cell in our body 40 times over which is kind of crazy. Um, and it only takes like one, um, one cell, like one cell of essential oil to unlock a receptor site in our cells in our body. And for that oil to go in and do its job, whatever your body is needing at that time. Um, so it really doesn't take a lot of essential oil for um, really amazing effects, but just as quickly as they get into our body, they are also um, metabolized out of our body. Um, and this is part of the reason why you can't really like use too much essential oil because our body gets rid of it so quickly. Um, but one way to make sure that you're getting it in enough to really see the effect, um, whether it be like for your emotions or supporting your immune system, you want to be reapplying it every two to three hours or you want to be diffusing. Um, when you have a diffuser going, it's, it's releasing those cells into the air and you're breathing them in for hours at a time. And that's really helping your body to absorb all of the oils. It's just really crazy when you get more detailed into this, like there, you know, your body has certain needs and whenever you apply these oils or you breathe them in, it knows where these um, cells need to be sent, where the molecules need to be sent, and it sends them straight there. And as soon as that um, essential oil encounters the cell in your body and unlocks that receptor site, um, the, the oil does its job and does what it's designed to do. And it's just really, really cool. Another really cool thing about it is that, um, wow, I just totally lost my train of thought. It's not in my notes, so I forgot what I was gonna say. Let's see. It must not have been that important. Whatever, okay. Um, Oh, my grandma used to always say, if you forget what you're going to say, it was a lie. I don't think that's true, though. <laughs> but yeah, okay, well, that's a bummer. I feel like that was, it was going to be good. Whatever. Okay, so let's talk about the constituents. Essential oils are composed of about 300 different compounds. And these compounds, when put together, fall into different chemical classes called constituents. Um, if you know like those little chemical structures, like the little round ball with the sticks in between, if you, you know what I mean, okay, that is a constituent, okay? Authentic, that's the key word, authentic essential oils are generally divided into two groups of constituents. So you have hydrocarbons that are mostly terpenes, monoterpenes, sesquiterpenes, diterpenes, and oxygenated compounds, which are mainly esters, aldehydes, ketones, alcohols, phenols, and oxides. Okay, so this is where it starts to get really important where you're getting your oils from. 
And a lot of another reason why people may say that essential oils don't work is because they are not using an authentic, real essential oil, 100% pure. And that's why I'm so passionate about sharing Young Living because I can trust that these oils are 100% pure and they are authentic. Okay, and the reason why is because whenever an essential oil is synthetic or it's not distilled properly, which we're gonna get to in a second, um, it does not have nearly as many chemical constituents. And those constituents um, are what actually make oils effective and useful for our bodies. So lavender, authentic, 100% pure lavender, has 179 constituents. So that's 179 chemical constituents that all do a different job and play a different role in our bodies. And synthetic lavender only has four constituents. So 179 compared to four. And it's a very common for companies to produce synthetic oils to make a quick buck. So do not buy oils that have an expiration date. Do not buy oils that say do not ingest or flammable. Um, if it has any other ingredients besides essential oil, do not buy it. But honestly, you have to take that with a grain of salt because unfortunately the FDA does not regulate essential oils, which means that um, only 5% of the bottle has to contain pure essential oil for it to be called 100% pure. So the other 95% can be anything else and they do not have to list the ingredients. So you know it's bad when they're actually listing the ingredients. <laughs> like okay that's really a crappy oil um but you know just because it doesn't list other ingredients doesn't mean automatically that it's actually pure you need to know what company you're looking at okay so let's talk about some of the constituents that are found in essential oils we have okay and i'm not going to tell you guys what oils contain these constituents because the fda uh, wouldn't like that very much so if you want to screenshot this, look up essential oils that have terpenes, essential oils that have esters, um, and find which oils contain these constituents and draw your own conclusions from there. Okay, terpenes are antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, antiviral. Esters are antifungal, calming and relaxing. Aldehydes are anti-infectious, sedative to the central nervous system. Ketones stimulate cell regeneration, promote formation of tissues, liquefy mucus. Um, I will go back really quick. Aldehydes are highly reactive and characterized by the group CHO, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, so they can actually be quite irritating when applied topically, but have profound calming effects when inhaled, okay? Ketones stimulate cell regeneration, promote the formation of tissues and liquefy mucus. Alcohols are commonly recognized for their antiseptic and antiviral activities. Terpene alcohols stimulate the immune system, work as a diuretic and a general tonic, and are generally antibacterial. Phenols are responsible for the fragrance of an oil. They are antiseptic, antibacterial, and strongly stimulating. Eugenol is in this category, okay? Oxides, by definition, is a binary compound of an element or a radical with an oxygen. Cineol or eucalyptol is by far the most important member of the oxide family and virtually exists in a class of its own. It is an, an anesthetic, antiseptic, and it works as an expectorant, okay? So those are just some of the constituents. Um, there's a lot more, okay? Um, but that's just a few of the things that essential oils contain and what they do for our bodies. So you guys, I just have to, I have to emphasize this is science, you guys, and I think that's one of the number one things that people have against essential oils. They're like, well, you know, it's just like crunchy, natural stuff. <laughs> and um, people aren't educated on the science behind it. When what's crazy is that um, a lot of our modern day medicine were designed to replicate essential oils. So they saw something that was working in nature and they wanted to 
um, make money off of it. You cannot patent a plant, but you can patent a drug. So if you were to design something that could be re replicated perfectly every single time, um, then why not do that? And then you can make money, you can patent it, and um, it will always be exactly the same. Now, the problem with that is, I'm sorry, I'm looking for a picture that I meant to pull up, and I totally forgot. The problem with the fact that they make drugs like that, I mean, obviously, like I said at the beginning of this, please don't take my words out of context. I 100% support and believe in modern medicine, and I know that it's extremely important in many cases, but um, there are flaws and drawbacks to modern medicine, um, one of which being that your body can grow a tolerance because it is exactly the same every single time you take a pill, it's going to have the exact same formula and every single time you take it, it's going to be exactly the same. Your body can grow up a tolerance to that, but it's different with essential oils because every batch of oil is going to be slightly different. Um, depending on how much sun there was when you were growing it, how much rain there was, what, um, you know, how much nutrients were in the soil. Those little things are going to change the, the composition of the plant. So your oils, though, will be generally the same because it's the same plant, are going to be slightly different every time. So your body can't build up that tolerance. And um, it, they are actually used in hospitals um, in parts of the country because of that. Another reason is that essential oils actually address the root issue. Um, and that is a big part of why, I'm gonna, I don't have to sh keep sharing my screen. Um, that is a big part of the reason why we use essential oils is for preventative medicine instead of just treating symptoms. So um, although not every disease or you know, issue we face can be dealt with um, preventatively. Sometimes you do need um, actual, you know, things to treat the symptoms. There is a lot, a lot, a lot that can be prevented by lifestyle changes, whether that's using essential oils, switching out your products um, to have toxin-free plant-based products, or, you know, having an air filter in your home, having a good water filtration system, um, all those different things can affect and are preventative measures. So essential oils are used as preventative measures. They're not going to be as effective once you like are already in desperate need of them. Um, it's better to use them on a regular basis to help support your body instead of to only pull them out when you have an issue. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about is steam distillation and how we distill essential oils. Um, this is huge because this is like the reason why the essential oil industry um, is such a crapshoot. It's so hard to find good essential oils and it's the reason why I only choose Young Living. Young Living has the most extensive library of essential oils and information on essential oils, how to distill them, how to grow the plants, all of these things, when exactly to harvest them. I mean, everything under the sun. I'm gonna do another class all about seed to seal, which is that whole side of things. But I want you guys to understand that distilling essential oils is a very precise um, process. It takes a lot of time and patience and money and if you want to cut corners there are a lot of ways that you can do that and basically every company out there is cutting corners because essential oils are expensive they are not going to be cheap and if they are cheap that should be a red flag Okay, so let's talk about why that is. So steam distillation is using a specific temperature, pressure, and length of time to extract the essential oils from a plant. You can also get essential oils through cold pressing, like with um, you know, citrus fruits using the rind, or resin tapping, like I was talking about earlier with frankincense. 
um, but the majority of plants are steam distilled. The tiniest misstep can have a huge change in the chemical structure of the oil. And whenever you change the chemical structure of the oil, you are negating its effectiveness. So whether it becomes less effective or completely ineffective just depends on how bad you mess it up. Um, herbicides and chemicals applied near or on the plants harvested will react with the essential oils during distillation. So not only will it be adding toxins, but it's actually going to change the oil itself and it will create toxic compounds and affect the constituents and thus the therapeutic benefits. So um, if your plants are being sprayed with herbicides or pesticides, either directly or indirectly, um, you're going to have issues. Your plants are not going to be as effective. Your oils are not going to be as effective. And um, they're actually going to be toxic. The thing is that to not use pesticides or herbicides, you have to spend literally like six, I think it's $16,000 per acre to hand weed lavender instead of using $60, six zero to use pesticides. So that's a huge price difference. And other people out there farming are not taking those extreme measures, most likely, because it's really expensive. Um, that's another reason why people will say like, oh, Young Living so expensive. Um, but really, you get what you pay for. If you are paying for high quality oils, then you are going to most likely get those high quality oils. So that's what we want. Um, let's talk about an example here, okay? So cypress oil, amazing oil. I talked about it in the Oils of the Bible class last night with my team. It's amazing, okay? It's great for so many things. But cypress oil is distilled for 24 hours at 245 degrees and five pounds of pressure. When you do it that way, all 280 active constituents and properties um, and full therapeutic effects are present, okay? So 24 hours at 245 degrees with five pounds of pressure. If you distill it for less than 22 hours, you will um, be missing 18 to 20 of the primary constituents, okay? So it goes from 280 to maybe like, 255 to 260. Okay, so that's obviously not what we want, but it's not the worst, I guess. If you distill cypress for 26 hours, so only two hours more, it loses all of its chemical constituents. All of it. Nada. No more. Okay, so that basically makes it a good smelling oil that does nothing for you. Most companies distill Cypress for one hour and 15 minutes. Look, you guys, I don't, I don't know how many constituents that is, that leaves, but I can guess it's probably not that many. Um, okay, two hours and you lose 18 to 20. I mean, yeah, one hour and 15 minutes. Yeah, not okay. So that is what you're looking at. You're looking at companies who do not take the same time and effort to make sure they're distilling their plants perfectly. And Young Living takes that time. The last thing is that oils can be distilled up to, distilled up to four times. So every time they distill it, it increases the volume of the oil, but it loses potency. Um, so a lot of companies will do this because it makes the oil smell sweeter. But when you make them more in volume but less in potency, they really aren't nearly as effective and you'd have to use way more. And then of course when you're throwing in other toxins and chemicals and synthetic oils and you're just, they just mix all these concoctions, they do all this stuff that is just rendering these oils either completely ineffective or completely toxic and bad for you. So understanding how essential oils work and the chemistry behind them 
um, is vital to understanding why quality is so important. And um, I trust Young Living because they're the only company where you can actually visit their farms, you can visit um, their distilleries, you can actually participate in the process. Um, they have over 30 years experience um, in distilling essential oils. They have the most extensive library on essential oils. And that includes even knowing like the exact time to harvest a plant when it's going to have the most, um, like the most beneficial constituents within the essential oils. I mean, that literally is like, there's one, I don't even know which plant it is, but I heard this story. One plant that has to be picked. They have like one hour and a one hour window where they have to harvest it and then they have to leave it on the concrete in the sun for a certain amount of time because it starts to die more and that produces more essential oil because when you injure a plant, that essential oil is going to be produced to help try and repair it. So as it's dying, it's producing more essential oil and then they distill it. It's like, really? Do you think everybody out there is doing that? I don't think so. So I'm sure there are countless stories like that where they are just going above and beyond. And when you understand what um, makes essential oils so unique and so beneficial to our bodies, you'll understand why the process of extracting them is so important. And it's so important we know where we're getting our oils from. So um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope that it wasn't too glitchy. If it was, I will redo it if you guys wanna see it. I think that it's just really incredibly fascinating stuff. Um, I would love to go more in depth into all of it. I only know like the basics, but I would love to learn more. And I would love to do this in person sometime so we can talk a little more freely. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you guys so much. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I would love to talk to you about getting started with Young Living. If you um, have maybe been using oils and maybe think that you need to switch to a better company, I'll be your girl. I'll help you out. Um, but yeah, okay. Thank you guys so much. Have a wonderful Wednesday and I'll talk to you later. Bye.